Anyway, all right, MSK. Um, so in this next 40 minutes, uh, we are certainly not going to make anybody an expert in MSK ultrasound. Um, you know, it's going to take a lot of time and practice to, to do that. Um, but um, what I'm hoping to do is just kind of expose you guys to the breadth of uh, what MSK ultrasound can do, um, you know, and, uh, and kind of help us you know, give us a few other exams that we can do uh, for patients. So why MSK? Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, does require a detailed knowledge of anatomy, um, but with that anatomy, and once you see it, then you can expand kind of the the um, the understanding of pathology um, that's going on. Um, but it does re require some practice. Um, so our goal today is basically expose you to the role that MSK ultrasound plays, um, and then look at some cases where it, it's been instrumental in kind of helping make the, the diagnosis for the patient, um, and teach you some some basic exams. So. Remember, just kind of big picture, point of care ultrasound is ultrasound performed by the clinician at the bedside, really designed to answer specific questions, um, you know, to enhance that phys physical, um, physical exam and the history that you take. Um, and the beauty of it is that you can directly correlate your image findings um, in the context of the patient that you have and not have to rely on like a one liner, um, you know, for why you're ordering the study. Um, so you can say, oh, I know that it hurts here when I examine and, you know, I do the study and oh, there's why. Um, that being said, comprehensive MSK ultrasound is performed usually by radiology, um, you know, to evaluate specific MSK complaints. Um, and it, it can be quite effective, right? In the hands of skilled operators, it can be, you know, nearly as good as MRI. Um, you know, it's got the benefit of being a non-invasive like MRI, uh, but the benefit that it, that it uh, gives us over something like MRI or CT is that it's dynamic. So you can actually move things around um, and see what happens. So you can see if a you know, if a tendon tear separates, you can see if there's, um, you know, what the joint does to your range of motion. So, um, so there's benefits there. So if we kind of put those two together and marry them up, um, basically it's a rapid bedside ultrasound to evaluate MSK complaints uh, relative to a specific concern um, and answer to specific questions. And I think if we keep it down to like, what is you know, that specific question of, I want to know this and I get the ultrasound um, and answer that specific question that really helps um, kind of formulate that study. Uh, what, what it doesn't really perform well for in our context is I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to go fishing. Um, you know, so, um, so formulate that question, um, but it can really enhance our physical exam. So just as a word of caution, you know, it's all very ultrasound dependent or operator dependent. Um, you know, so just because, um, it can be done doesn't mean that it's effectively done by all who try it. Um, and, um, MSK can be a huge time sink, uh, depending on, um, you know, what you're doing and how much time you put into this thing. So uh, that being said, um, if we kind of take a patient uh, with a specific complaint of pain or swelling um, and kind of boil that down into a yes, no question of, hey, did they have this as their etiology, then um, putting that probe on can, can often be, can be helpful. Um, and we're gonna think about it in the context of looking for effusions, dislocations, fractures, tendon injuries, you know, guiding our procedures as well as, you know, looking at, you know, soft tissue swelling. Um, so what you do really depends on, like I said, your presentation, your skill set. Um, you know, we've had Ben Boswell from UH give lectures uh, to us about MSK ultrasound, and he is a master uh, at MSK ultrasound. Um, and so his skill set that he um, that he he brings is going to be significantly greater than mine. Um, and so what he's going to be able to to identify um, is going to be significantly greater than mine. You know, what I will be able to, but. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that someone with a lower skill set doesn't have the ability to take this and kind of, you know, gain information about, about the patient, right? So, uh, to do this, generally it requires a high frequency linear tr transducer. Most of the stuff is very superficial. Um, and, you know, you want that resolution that this transducer is going to provide. Um, that being said, some people need greater penetration. So, you may have to switch over to um, the curvilinear um, if you just have a lot of tissue to get through. Um, the one difference um, with MSK versus regular ultrasound is the probe indicator is oftentimes being um, oriented relative to the structure being scanned, um, as opposed to necessarily the patient's uh, true sac or transverse orientation. Um, we also kind of rename things a little bit. So instead of being sag and transverse, it's oftentimes labeled short and long. So if you're doing a tendon, um, you know, the probe orientation is going to be relative to that tendon. Um, and when we see it in long axis, instead of being on it like tendon sad, we're going to call it tendon long. And same thing for cross-section, tendon short versus tendon transverse. So um, 
as far as presets, you want to optimize your environment. So obviously set that up the way um, or use utilize the preset. So picking a high frequency transducer, um, you know, and, and optimizing it will optimize things like your frequency and your harmonics and your compound imaging. So pick that MSK preset. Uh, as for patient prep, you know, obviously you need to expose the area of concern. Um, the favorite thing that Cleveland patients like to do when they come in with MSK complaints is they have their three layers of clothes and their hoodie. And then they put the hospital gown on top of all that, thinking that there's something magical about the hospital gown that allows me to penetrate all the way through all those three layers of clothes. Um, when in reality, it just adds an extra layer of complexity. So get all those layers off um, so that you can actually expose the area of concern, place the patient in a position of comfort. Um, and then, you know, the copious use of gel or a water bath will enhance the comfort as the patient may experience uh, when doing this study. So here's an example of a standoff pad. This works really well for abscesses. The gel um, and float the transducer over that pile of gel. So it's not really putting pressure on the, the structure, but it's, it's um, you know, still providing that coupling that you need. Um, and the other option is just a water bath, right? So, um, you know, certain things you can't do a water bath on. So if you're doing a transcranial Doppler, it's probably not gonna be terribly effective to put the patient in a water bath, at least for a prolonged period of time. Um, but if you're just evaluating their, um, their extremities, right? If you're evaluating a finger or something like that, it's easy to put in water bath. So um, you put that in water and the, the transducer head is generally watertight. So you can put that in, as long as you don't get water kind of in the cable end um, you can get some coupling, um, you know, coupling with just the water. Uh, so here's an example of my finger, where you can actually see the finger down the, down low, um, and a picture of what's going on. So, um, and again, the other thing, the other benefit is dynamic scanning. So scan through the area of concern, um, and then scan through the whole range of motion. So this is a shoulder that you're just internally and externally rotating. You can see kind of how that joint, you know, articulates and kind of the musculature um, that's involved there. Uh, as we go through this, we got to think through the different tissue types. You know, remember, so we're going to start with our sub Q tissue, you know, followed by our, you know, you know cutaneous uh, or the, the, the tissue below that. Um, so you can definitely see the different layers. You know, we have that, um, the, the epidermis, the dermis, um, you know, kind of that subcutaneous uh, tissue in, in the various different, you know, layers that we see on the ultrasound. Um, they're going to have their own distinct sonographic echo textures, right? So you have the at the very top, kind of that homogeneous appearance of the epidermis, and then you kind of have all those lobular septae, um, kind of that dermal tissue uh, down below it. Uh, muscles are going to look very different, right? On ultrasound, they kind of look like a nice steak. Um, so they are going to be, um, you know, basically we know the architecture of a muscle, you know, the muscle fibers all wrapped together to be a bundle, and the bundles kind of all wrapped together to make a big body. Um, and it's going to have that very, um, very coarse linear te texture. Uh, in long axis, you'll you know you'll see kind of these, this fibrous appearance. Um, this is what I'm saying. It looks like just a nice steak that you're going to toss on the grill. Um, in the short axis, it's going to have kind of starry night, that Van Gogh starry night appearance. So here's a a muscle. You just kind of, again, this looks like a cross section of a piece of meat. Nice marbled steak, but um, um, you can also kind of imagine it in the context of Van Gogh, and it's going to have that similar starry night type appearance. Are usually hyperechoic. They're very fibular um, and striated. They have a very organized echo texture, very almost homogeneously organized echo texture, um, very linear and streaky. Um, you'll oftentimes see like if you move dynamically, you'll see them moving. Um, and this is a long axis appearance. Uh, in short axis, you see here, um, you can see kind of uh, just an oval shaped, um, you know, kind of that similar starry night appearance, but a little bit more dense um, in terms of the the granularity. So like if muscles are like an 80 grit sandpaper, it'd be like a hundred grit sandpaper. Um, and they also experience this phenomenon that you're seeing here called anisotropy, where as you angle the probe away from 90 degrees, um, you have a darkening of that structure, right? So the, um, the tendons and, and um, nerves to a lesser degree um, are very angle dependent. So the angle of is the angle of reflection, um, you know, in physics and, and these are very sensitive to that. So if you're not on 90 degrees, it's going to bounce a lot of that, that sound waves away from your transducer, and you're not going to pick it back up. So it's going to be, be very high. So you got to be very careful that you're scanning at 90 degrees on these on these structures. 
So here's an example uh, where that becomes important. This is the Achilles tendon insertion on the calcaneus. Um, and the tendon off on the left side of the screen actually looks normal. Um, but as you can see it on the right side of the screen, it becomes hypoacoic. And so it'd be easy to say, hey, you know, if there's an injury there because uh, it loses its normal echotexture. Um, but in reality, that's just the tendon kind of wrapped around the calcaneus um, and you're seeing anisotropy uh, being exhibited here. So if you were to adjust your angle of your probe, um, you could definitely make that dark spot on the right side of the screen kind of lighten up a little bit um, as it inserts on the calcaneus. Um, nerves um, are kind of like tendons, but a little bit more coarse, right? So they have this uh, home appearance and short axons, they often have that, that angular, like that triangular type of appearance. Um, they are oftentimes paired with blood vessels, although they certainly can run um, on their own. And they oftentimes run along fascial planes. Um, uh, so you'll see those um, kind of traversing through, through various tissues. Normally bone um, is gonna be the last structure that we're looking at. And this is, you know, we're used to this in the context of something rather annoying, um, complicating a fast exam, um, but the same principles or properties apply. They tend to have a hyperechoic surface uh, with deep, deep dark shadowing kind of below that as most of the sound is reflected rather than uh, transmitted. Um, and they tend to have a, a rather smooth border. Hyaline cartilage uh, is gonna be on the articular surfaces of bones, right? Um, and in the majority of joints. Um, it tends to be a hypoechoic ring, so it's easy to, to um, misinterpret hyaline cartilage as a joint infusion or a small joint infusion if you're not looking for it or not thinking about it. Um, but it's going to usually be a thin layer that you know, conforms to the contour of that joint. Um, and if you look and you're built in normal on the other side, you'll, you'll see something very similar. Um, but here's an example of some cartilage on top of that, that joint surface. Um, so, so in the remainder of the time that we have here, we're just going to talk about some cases here, you know, kind of how we can apply that information to, to the bedside. So um, first case, a 20 year old uh, dude who, with some ankle pain, uh, basically was saying, I was playing some Frisbee and felt something pop, now has pain in the posterior ankle. Um, the Thompson test is equivocal. Uh, so, I mean, this one is clinically very self-evident, um, you know, it screams an Achilles tendon injury. Uh, but when you put the probe on the patient, um, you know, it, it basically illustrates what we suspect, but sometimes the, the story is not as clear. So if you can see, I don't know if I can put this, I don't know, my pointer, look kind of right there, right? I'll take it off. Um, so you have the Achilles tendon at that level. Uh, on the left side, you have the proximal portion of the tendon, on the right side, you have the distal portion of the tendon. Um, and as you range that, you can see a separation with some fluid kind of in the intervening space. Um, and this is, so there's no um, uh, no connection between the two. Um, so you can see Achilles tendon ruptures, right? It's basically the Achilles uh, connects the gastric to the calcaneus, um, and a sudden force can cause it to rupture. Uh, patients often here clinically will have a positive Thompson test, which basically means there's no movement of that that ankle joint when you squeeze the calf, right? Normally, if you have a intact Achilles, if you squeeze the calf, you'll get some um, you know, some movement of that, you know, of that ankle as the Achilles tendon pulls the calcaneus. Um, these can be either partial or, or complete. Uh, completes are the easy ones. You basically see what you see here, just a, a tearing away. And oftentimes um, they're associated with some extra fluid. So you'll see fluid kind of around that tendon. Um, a partial rupture, uh, you know, total discontinuity, but you'll see a disruption of the normal tendinous architecture, right? So instead of it being you know, thin um, and very striated, you're gonna see something that's gonna be thickened and kind of the loss of that striated architecture. And it'll look very different to the collateral. So remember, here's the normal, right? It's a very thin tendon. Um, it's very, very organized in its, in its linear uh, echo texture. Um, in cross section here is kind of a normal. Um, again, it's kind of oval shaped, very consistent echo texture uh, as you scan through it. Um, but when you, um, when you injure that, you're basically going to uh, of that architecture. And if you can see on either side of the, the arrow here, um, you know, where you're still looking at the tendon, you can even see just kind of loss of that fibrous um, appearance. Um, so does that make sense? Here's an example of a partial tendon rupture. Uh, you know, so in this picture, let me put my right in there, um, you basically see a thickened, um, tendon that the echo texture has changed, right? It's darker than it normally is. 
um, it's lost that normal fibrous appearance, um, just kind of looks like this big amorphous blob. Um, so that would be suggestive of kind of a, a partial tendon rupture. Um, and again, what you're going to want to be looking for is kind of that surrounding fluid that you can kind of see um, around this area. So case number two, 40 year old gentleman with shoulder pain um, said he got his pain after lifting some heavy objects. Uh, pain is in the proximal humerus and you notice a deformity of the biceps muscle. So you get the Popeye, um, Popeye sign, um, basically the biceps muscle uh, being rather large compared to the other one. Uh, so if you scan kind of long axis, you get this disappearance. And basically what we're looking at here, uh, just move it over. So right in there, you see kind of a, a ruptured biceps tendon. Um, so you're gonna see the distal portion um, on the right hand side of the screen here. Um, so it's gonna be that portion of the tendon in the proximal part of the biceps muscle is kind of contracting down. You're gonna see some fluid in that tendon space um, that we can see at the black. And then if we were to skate up a little bit north, um, you would see the, the proximal end of that a complete tear of the bottom of the tendon. As you scan in transverse, you can see the tendon um, in the occipital groove. This is the first part of the body. Just that here. Um, and as we scan, so there's tendons in the bicipital groove. We scan it down, all of a sudden we're going to lose the tendon there. Um, we see a whole bunch of fluid kind of with the retracted end of the, you know, the, the biceps, um, kind of the other end of that, that tendon tear. Uh, so it's a rather easy, easy one to scan on the anterior part of the shoulder. Basically, you start up, you find that bicipital groove, and you scan up and down um, along that tendon to see kind of a discontinuity there. So, oftentimes, this is the long head of the biceps um, that travels through the bicipital groove um, that's that's injured, right? Uh, pierces a discontinuity of the tendon. Um, you may see an absence of tendon in that groove. Um, and again, like the Achilles, there oftentimes be surrounding fluid. So, next case is a 60 year old dude with knee pain. Uh, pain is worse. Uh, with walking, uh, seen previously with concern for a partial quad tendon rupture, uh, and now has a palpable defect along uh, the superior border of the patella, and he is no longer able to perform a straight leg raise. So again, when you're looking at the, the quadriceps patellar apparatus, uh, this is an important test to do, and if they can't hold their leg up without it just bending at the knee, then you have to be concerned about a discontinuity of that quadriceps patellar, patellar tendon apparatus. So. So again, scan in long and short axis right above uh, the patella, right? So on the ultrasound image here on the right side of the screen, you see the patella. Um, so if I go over here, this is the patella right here. Uh, you can see that bony appearance, the hyperechoic cortex with the deep shadowing. Um, and then over here is gonna be the, the quads muscle kind of going into the quads tendon. And there should be continuity between these two, right? Um, and this is really easy to follow down. Uh, but here we see a, an abrupt discontinuity between the quads tendon and the patella and a whole bunch of fluid kind of surrounding that. Uh, so this patient had a complete quadriceps tendon rupture, uh, which was not good because he had ignored his partial quadriceps tendon rupture and then completed it. Um, of course, I said there's really not much that they can do uh, at that point doing this. Um, so the next case is a 30 year old dude with painful swelling to the knee, um, left knee pain for a couple of days, seen at the urgent care, sent for evaluation to rule out septic joint um, in the ED. Um, and he works stocking shelves at the store, right? So clinically this looks like, kind of got some erythema uh, over the patella, um, hurt when he bent his knee. So I can understand why the urgent care got concerned. When you scan him, you find a whole bunch of fluid kind of in the subcutaneous tissue. So if we're looking here, um, what we see on the left side of the screen, right there is the, uh, I gotta get my bearings here. Remind myself of this case. You have both there. That's gonna be the patella. Yeah, yeah. So this is patella, right? Um, and then we're looking at the patellar tendon coming down and inserting on the tibial porosity of the tibia right there. And so all of the business that's going on in this image um, is happening um, superficial to that patellar tendon, right? We don't see much of a joint infusion. Um, you know, and we have a whole bunch of fluid collection there. So this is actually superficial bursitis, right? So here's a short axis view, kind of scan it through it. There's a whole bunch of fluid um, kind of in that subcutaneous area, right? Um, bursitis is basically caused by repetitive microtrauma, uh, inflammation, or infection. Um, I think there's there's other you know eponyms for this. Um, one of them was it nun's knee um, for like when you're kneeling, praying a lot, um, you know, the, 
guy who's stocking the shelves, you know, that certainly is, is possible. I think there's a, something that references a, someone who cleans or does housemaking um, or a, I don't, I'm blanking on it. Um, but anyway, it, it's basically the same mechanism of constant microtrauma um, of the knee. Um, and you have localized tenderness anterior to the patella, uh, appears as a hypochoic fluid collection um, in that superficial tissues. Now it may have some internal echoes um, and there's some discussion about, you know, a lot of these are, are septic and, um, you know, probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't be terribly harmed by, by, uh, by needle aspiration, um, you know, and some antibiotics. Um, the bursae, uh, I mean, are basically fluid pads that are normally not visible, uh, are terribly visible on ultrasound, um, but they basically lubricate uh, joints and, you know, surfaces that move relative to one another. And so there's a number of them throughout the knee, um, but this prepatellar bursa is probably one of the more common ones that we'll see um, inflamed um, and, and causing pathology. So again, here's just a little bit of the, the anatomy. So the patella, patella tendon, and that fluid collection anterior to that. Uh, next case is a 50-year-old dude with left knee pain, um, was walking, felt a pop, and now has pain and swelling to the left knee. Um, so... Uh, basically what we're looking at here is the quad tendon up here, right? Here's the patella that's inserting on some fluid deep to that quad tendon, right? So this is a little bit different than the case we just saw. Um, again, fluid deep to that quad tendon uh, right there. And this is in the suprapatellar recess. Uh, so this is a knee effusion, right? So knee effusions oftentimes present as an anechoic fluid uh, in that suprapatellar recess um, with a knee in slight flexion. Now, I did a little bit of um, digging, I'm gonna back up a little bit, um, because one of the things you'll find that will cause a significant degree of, of con um, confusion is if you look at uh, where the bursae are, there's actually a bursa, technically, underneath the, um, the quad tendon, right? Um, and so some people say in the reality reports, this is an effusion or bursitis, um, but kind of like um, a, uh, Baker's cyst, oftentimes those are fused and connected. And so the effusion causes kind of swelling in this technically bursa. So uh, generally speaking, if you have fluid underneath the the, um, the quad tendon, that's generally considered a, a knee effusion. You can look around at other other areas around that knee to see if, if you can you know, correlate it. But um, generally when I see it there, I'm, I treat it like an effusion, right? Uh, again, these may have internal echoes to indicate infection or hemorrhage. Uh, but you can't necessarily rely exclusively on that to, to diagnose the etiology of the fluid. Um, uh, certainly, this is a, a concept that we've tried to instill on people here, um, and for most part, people get it, but sometimes people fail to remember that I may see fluid somewhere, but I can't tell you what that fluid is exclusively with using ultrasound. That's going to oftentimes need a needle to, to sort that one out. Um, so here's another interesting one. Um, this is a case that I just pulled off the internet, um, but since then, we've had cases, and I just haven't haven't updated with with our case files, but 16 year old dude uh, with knee pain after a fall, right? Uh, so actually looks pretty decent, right? You scan them and we see this, right? So this is the suprapatellar recess. Right? So here's that fluid deep to the quad tendon. But what we have is we have very two very distinct echo textures in that fluid. We have a hyperechoic and a hypoechoic um, fluid. So this is actually an interesting one, and um, for some reason we've seen like two or three of these, at least two of them um, in the last couple months here at Metro. Um, but this is basically a lipohemarthrosis, right? Uh, so it's going to be fluid and fat, um, and there's a high degree of concordance between this and uh, tibial plateau fractures. So if you see a lipoheme, um, you have to think tibial plateau, and it probably is not a bad idea to CT that person's knee. Uh, so in the case that I had here, um, we had a, a knee injury, x-ray was red as libohem. We went and looked at it with ultrasound for grins and giggles because we could. Um, but the next test that I ordered was a, um, uh, a CT and sure enough, they had a, um, had a, a, a fracture, an occult fracture of their knee. Uh, I think that one might've been more on the fibular side, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but you gotta think um, tibial plateaus with these lipohemes, right? Um, so next case is a 30 year old dude with shoulder pain, um, heard uh, a pop and felt pain and it's got some slight deformity to the anterior shoulder. Um, so this here is basically a ultrasound done at the posterior aspect uh, of the shoulder in transverse orientation. What we're seeing is um, basically 
the uh, scapula, right? The glenoid, and then here's the, the um, humeral head that's displaced anteriorly. Remember, we're, this is posterior, that's anterior. So anteriorly from the, the glenoid. So this is an anterior uh, shoulder dislocation. Uh, so most common dislocation, um, <clears throat> like I said, most are, an, are anterior. Uh, you want to scan posterior to the shoulder um, uh, with the trans, transducer and the transverse orientation, uh, kind of like this, right? And um, so this is normal, right? You have that um, that uh, scapula and the, the fossa right there uh, with the, the normal humeral head articulating back and forth, um, kind of internal and external uh, range of motion. Um, and when you dislocate the, the shoulder, you'll see kind of a, a movement. Uh, it's almost kind of like a, if you go back and think about this, it's like an ice cream cone uh, on its side, right? So, um, oops, it's the wrong button. This button. So there's the cone, right? And there's the, the ball of ice cream. The shoulder's the ball of ice cream. If you go to the next image here, you can see your, your cone and your ice cream is falling off, right? That's an anterior dislocation. Um, actually, I haven't pulled up the, the text of the paper yet, but EMA from May um, of this year had a, a study where um, they're looking at use of ultrasound to to um, identify these dislocations. And they had a really unique um, technique where they just put, I got to try this out here, I haven't tried it yet, but basically take the probe and transverse orientation, put it on the spine of the scapula. So they just palpated that, put it on there and just zipped out laterally and it basically led them right to this window. Um, and they found, I think it was like within seconds, uh, they were able to identify, uh, I think it was within 19 seconds or so, they were able to identify the, the shoulder dislocation. So um, I like to use this kind of as we, reduce the patient or not terribly sure if, it, if that shoulder's in, just kind of look and see, um, you know, is that joint back in place? Um, and can I, you know, sling them and send them down to x-ray for their, their post film? So anyway, uh, interesting technique. Um, so here's the post shoulder reduction. You can see, um, you know, the glenoid here, uh, the humeral head kind of all back in alignment. We're back in, the, in a good place. Uh, I believe this is the final case. So um, angry teen hits a wall. They got mad about something that a teenager get, gets mad about. Um, and this is their fifth metacarpal, uh, or fifth, yeah, metacarpal, essentially. Um, we see a, an angulation um, of the bony, oh man, the video's not supposed to do. Uh, architecture right there. Uh, and if you look carefully, there's gonna be a discontinuity of that, that hyper. Uh, so this is a bone fracture, right? Um, so right there, uh, is that fracture, there's a, um, uh, an angulation of that fracture. Um, so you can utilize this to make the diagnosis, or what I like to do is utilize it to assist in my reduction. Um, so you identify the location of the fracture, um, and it you know, basically appears a cortical irregularity, um, you, know, you know, oftentimes with angu angulation. Uh, in this context, other, bone, other fractures may not be angulated, right? Um, and so there's going to be some, some um, interoperable variability, um, you know, to identify these things. If it's a very, very small, non-displaced fracture, it may be very, very challenging, um, but certainly something that can be done. Um, so in the context of these, um, these boxers of fractures, what I like to do is put the probe on, identify the location of the fracture, um, and then using ultrasound guidance, just put a needle right at that fracture site and do a, uh, basically a hematoma block, ultrasound guided hematoma block, um, you know, of that, of the area. So you can see the needle coming in the left side. Um, and as you get close, you'll see the right now you're going to inject a little bit of lidocaine there. Um, and then after a few minutes, they're usually pretty numb where you can kind of mash on that finger pretty good without, without a lot of pain. So I'll put them in traps, let them hang for about 20, 30 minutes, um, and then come back and splint them. And it tends to work pretty decent. Uh, so here's the post film uh, once they're reduced. Um, so we got rid of a lot of that angulation. So just by review, uh, musculoskeletal po uh, POCUS is basically a limited exam to answer specific questions uh, for disorders involving muscles, bones, and joints. Um, you know, the applicability to varies dependent on your comfort level um, and kind of what you're, you know, what you can do and what you're pr privileged to do. A um, couple things just to be, watch out for is that anisotropy. Uh, it's going to really trip you up if you're not, not careful. 